Thank you for coming this evening. We weren't sure what kind of weather to expect, and so we really appreciate you um, uh, coming out to be with us um, tonight. This is our fourth program of the Foundation's Art and Humanity series. We're hoping that you will return to Moffitt Auditorium on Monday, April the 4th at 5.30 to see Passion, Power, and Prejudice, the poetry of 9-11. We'll have well-known poets, some uh, from our region, uh, to read their contributions to the book, Crossing the Rift, North Carolina Poets on 9-11 and its Aftermath. So please come in and join us. In your brochure, it said that it, uh, the program would be in Walnut 101, but we have moved it um, to Moffitt. So next Monday in Moffitt Auditorium. But tonight we focus on a current event that has both horrified and captivated us through the media, the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And Dr. Graham Robertson is here to help us understand what happened. He was very gracious to accept our invitation on short notice and also um, by being in high demand able to fit it in his schedule to come be with you. And we thank you, Graham. We expect many questions from our audience, and we, um, and for those who are viewing at home, please post yours in the YouTube chat feature. Now tonight, we may have a technical difficulty or two. Our projector, which was working great um, last night, um, has sometimes goes off five seconds, will reboot or come back on, and uh, just understand we're aware of it. We want to make you aware of it and not think that we have been, you know, hacked by Russians. Um, a former student of Graham's will have the honor of introducing him. Her name is Anna Snyder, and uh, she is a reference librarian at the Wayne County uh, Public Library. The library is a valuable partner with our Arts and Humanities program. Thank you, Anna. Hello. So my name is Anna Snyder. I'm the head of the reference department at Wayne County Public Library over on Ash Street. I was excited to be asked to introduce our speaker tonight because when I was an undergrad, I was a Russian and East European studies major and minored in Slavic literature. Um, and I worked at this place that he is the director of, the Center for Slavic, Eurasian, and East European Studies. So I was like, ooh, I get to tell people my professor is in town. So <laughs> my parents will be very excited that I'm using my education. And um, we were laughing before because he was a professor of mine, and I couldn't quite remember what class it was, but I remember it was 8 o'clock in the morning, so I was very invested in it. So tonight we're going to hear from Graham Robertson. He is the Harold J. Glass USAF Faculty Mentor Distinguished Professor of Political Science at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and the Director of the Center for Slavic, Eurasian, and East European Studies. His work focuses on authoritarian politics. He has published two books, most recently Putin versus the People with Samuel Green. Graham publishes regularly in the Washington Post and other outlets and has published many articles on Russia and Ukraine in leading academic journals, including the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, the American Political Science Review, the American Journal of Political Science, and the Journal of Politics. So I hope we have a really robust discussion tonight, and I hope that you will join me in welcoming Graham Robertson. <laughs> Thank you, thank you so much, Anna, for that very kind introduction. Uh, it's a real pleasure to see you again um, uh, later in the day than we used to hang out at. Um, it's, it's, it's a real thrill for me to be here tonight with you. Um, so I'm very grateful to Charlotte and her team for inviting me. Um, this has been uh, a really tumultuous time uh, in, 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 well, in my life, but in the lives of, of so many people in this, in this last month. Uh, two countries well, that I've been studying for I'm working on for more than 30 years. Uh, all of a sudden, one invades the other with absolutely no 
provocation, no justification, uh, and no reason. Um, and it has turned the lives of, 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 uh, of millions of people upside down, both in, in Ukraine and in Russia, uh, uh, and, and you know, those of my personal friends, but also uh, of the broader community. Um, and one of the things I, I decided at, the, at the, the beginning of this conflict was just all of us felt completely helpless. Uh, and trying to think of different ways in which you know, a college professor in North Carolina could, could, could help, could make some kind of difference. Uh, and what is it that, that we can do? Uh, and one of those things, as always, is donate money. And I'll, I'll talk to you a little bit about that later at the, at the end. Um, but for me, the main thing has been to uh, do two things, to bring Ukraine's story and the voices of Ukrainians to as many North Carolinians uh, and people in the United States as I can. Um, and so uh, in doing so, uh, hopefully keeping the interest uh, and, and compassion for Ukrainians and the, and, and the situation in Ukraine uh, on the minds of, of, of people in the United States as this war goes forward. Sadly, and we'll talk more about this uh, later, but I suspect this war could last a long time. Uh, and so I worry a lot about attention fatigue, about you know, the, the, the inevitable wandering of attention to other subjects. So I'm extremely grateful to you all uh, for coming here tonight to, to, to talk more about it and to share um, some of our thoughts and, 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 and feelings about the war. Um, and I urge you, to, you know, to, to talk to your friends, talk to your family about it, uh, and try and keep this, this catastrophe, this tragedy, this, this man-made tragedy uh, in, the, in the front of their, of their minds. I'm going to talk, uh, I'm a political scientist. So I'm going to talk about two things. I'm going to show, talk a little bit about history uh, of the region and give you some, some context um, that hopefully I think will, will uh, shed light on things. And I'm going to talk about the politics of Ukraine uh, over the last uh, 20 years uh, in some more detail. I'm going to use some, some pictures. I'm going to use a couple of public opinion graphs. I uh, mostly collect public opinion data, both in Russia and Ukraine. So I'll show you some numbers that I think illustrate some, some important points. Um, but I'll also tell you the story um, that's primarily a story based on Ukraine and Ukraine's experience, uh, and not less um, the usual story which you hear in the, in the press, which is very often a, a conversation about Vladimir Putin and what his intentions are um, and, and you know, what he intends to do and, and why. Um, and that's important. It's an important part of the story, but I feel often that the Ukrainian side of the story gets lost in that focus on, on, on Putin. And I know from Ukrainian friends, there's nothing more annoying um, to then be invaded by a bully and everybody talk about the bully and not talk about you and, and, and what you're going through. Um, so that's another reason to, to focus um, uh, remarks on, 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 on Ukraine. I've written extensively on Putin. I've you know, followed his career for uh, 22 years. Um, and so I have lots of... Uh, informed and, and, and opinions about, about that subject, so I'm happy to talk about that also uh, when we get to the, the Q&A part. But let's start um, with uh, a discussion of, 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 of Ukraine and of present-day Ukraine. Um, and I wanted to just sort of start off with a map. It's always super useful to start off with a map um, so that we can get some sense of uh, what we're talking about and the, and the context. This is Ukraine. It's a, it's a really large country. It's about the size of France. Um, it's uh, got a smaller population than France. It's a population of about 40 million. Uh, it's a highly agricultural um, country, especially uh, from the center all the way to the west. 40% um, of the world's wheat comes out of Ukraine, or between Russia and Ukraine, comes out of these ports in the, in the south, uh, the port of, of, of Odessa primarily, um, but also the port of Mariupol over here, which you've uh, probably aware of has been under siege uh, very intensively over the last couple of weeks. Um, Ukraine is surrounded on three sides by Russia on this side, um, by Russian-occupied Crimea, this is this peninsula down here, um, which uh, was gifted to Ukraine or transferred to Ukrainian sovereignty in the 1950s by Nikita Khrushchev um, in the, during the Soviet period, and then to the north by Belarus. Um, Belarus is a, a country that we don't talk about very much, um, and it's one of the great untold stories of this war, this, 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 this invasion, is that essentially while Russia's w waged war against Ukraine, it's also annexed Belarus. It's moved hundreds of thousands of soldiers into Belarus uh, and now controls Belarus's borders. 
So Belarus still exists as an independent state on the map, but it's not a sovereign state anymore. Uh, and it doesn't control uh, its own politics, it doesn't control uh, its own destiny uh, in, any, in any meaningful way at this point. Um, and that's uh, you know, one of the, the, the untold stories of this, of this conflict. Um, the other place that I want to draw your attention to is this little tiny country here called Moldova. It's about the size of Maryland. Um, it's uh, Romanian speaking. Uh, it's the poorest country in Europe. Uh, and it's also twinned with North Carolina. Uh, so the, the state government of North Carolina, the Secretary of State's office, uh, interacts a lot with, with Moldova and provides assistance to Moldova. The, the UNC system, both UNC uh, Chapel Hill, UNCG, and the other parts of the system provide training for dentists and nurses uh, and doctors in Moldova. Uh, Moldova is, uh, has an army of about 6,000 men uh, and has zero tanks. Um, and it, there it is right next to, to Ukraine. And it's not, crucially, a member of NATO. Uh, so it's completely defenseless. Uh, should the Russians decide to, to move in. It's already partially occupied by Russian-supported forces, has been for, for 30 years. Um, so if Putin were to be successful in Ukraine, there's no reason to think Moldova would not be next. Moving sort of more broadly west, though, the situation does change. Poland, Slovakia, Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria, all these countries in, in the Czech Republic, all these countries, and then up here into the Baltic states, are all NATO allies. Um, so an attack on them is an attack on, on us. Uh, and and I, I would say 95% confident that that's actually what would happen in, in, in practice were they to be attacked by Russia. There's some ambiguity around the edges that we could talk about. But essentially, um, right now, those countries are, 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 are safe with the war at its current level. Would they remain safe and for how long, depending on the, the, the developments in Ukraine? I don't know. Um, but that's the, the sort of broader uh, political context which I hope um, is, is sort of helpful to give you a sense of, of, of what we're talking about here. I'm going to show you one historical map um, that makes, uh, I think, an important point. Kiev, the capital of Ukraine, was founded um, uh, in, in, in roughly uh, the year 1010, um, so a long time ago. Um, and it was founded basically by traders who were uh, Vikings coming from Scandinavia down the Dnieper River. This is the Dnieper River here. Uh, it's a big, wide river. Um, and it takes you down to the Black Sea and to what at that time were kind of uh, Greek and Turkic, Turkish uh, uh, populated areas um, and was a, a kind of outlet into uh, the, 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 the Black Sea first and then into the Mediterranean. And so the Vikings came down and, and they essentially colonized that area. Um, they came from a, a part of, of, uh, 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 of Scandinavia where, they, where the name of this group was the Rus, uh, and they gave their name ultimately to, to Russia. Um, so Russia, oddly enough, is named after a bunch of Swedes, which is kind of, kind of interesting. Um, what you see here in this, in this map um, is that, that, that Ukraine, Ukraine's this shape, this green outline shape here, present day Ukraine. Right? And what you see is that at various times, Bits of Ukraine belonged to Russia, the Russian Empire, this Donetsk, which uh, Russia reoccupied in 2014. Um, and then you know, for the last 300 years, they've had this whole area up to and including the capital of Kiev, um, and then expand, expanded further uh, west. Before that, the central part of Ukraine was dominated by the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, the Polish Empire. Um, uh, so a, a different uh, political system, a different style of government than, than, than the Russian Empire had. And in the far west of Ukraine, in particular the, the city of Lviv, uh, which is many in Ukraine think of as being the western capital, uh, was uh, occupied by the Austro-Hungarian Empire and developed under the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And then the south, which we can't see right now, but it'll be back, um, uh, was uh, dominated by Turkic tribes so the, the, what's, what's here called the, the Crimean Khanate. Uh, it's part of uh, Turkic-speaking uh, civilization. If you ever get a chance to go to Crimea after sanctions, um, you should go. Uh, it's absolutely gorgeous, and they have all of these really beautiful uh, Turkish uh, uh, ruins and, 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 and spas and, and, and thousand-year-old uh, uh, dwelling places that, that are really amazing to, to, to visit. So Ukraine has all of these different traditions going on. 
And political scientists see the, the remnants of these cultural traditions all across the country, and they have tended to create political divides uh, within post-communist Ukraine. And that's what I'm gonna talk about next. Uh, and then I'll talk about how those divides have been overcome um, in the last few years. Ukraine gained its independence following a referendum at the end of 1991. Uh, the Soviet Union collapsed at the end of 1991, and um, Ukraine became, for the first time in, in these current borders, uh, an independent state. Now, the Russians will tell you, well, ah, Ukraine's not real because, or not the Russians, Putin will tell you, that Ukraine's not real because it never existed in these borders before. That's true, Ukraine never existed in these borders before. Russia never existed in its current borders before either. Um, Germany's borders as they stand now are relatively recent. Uh, Spain's, all of these countries in Europe, the borders have moved around over time. N none of these borders are given you know, in any way from on high. Right? They're the product, product of political conflict and struggle. So the fact that Ukraine joins different lands that weren't before in one territory has nothing to do with anything. It's, it's, it's true, but it's irrelevant to the status of Ukraine as an independent uh, state. Ukraine voted uh, by overwhelmingly for its own independence. Ukrainians voted 92% uh, of, the, of, the, of the electorate voted for independence. And as you see by these numbers, these are the percentages in different regions of Ukraine. It varies a little bit, you know, almost 100%. <laughs> um, you almost think they were cheating uh, over here in the far west. But very, very healthy majorities in favor of independence, even in, this is Donetsk and, and this is Lugansk um, oblasts. The only place that was close to, that was almost close was Crimea itself, um, where only 54% voted for independence, but nonetheless a pretty clear majority. So there was this overwhelming national unity at the time of independence for Ukraine uh, to be an independent state. Um, at, this is back in the, in the early 1990s. Unfortunately, um, this unity started to uh, come apart over time. And it happened for a number of reasons, uh, but I think the most important reason was uh, the failure of the newly independent Ukraine to establish strong economic growth uh, and to establish the rule of law. Um, to illustrate the economic problems, all of the countries of the former Soviet Union, all of the post-communist countries had problems transitioning to the market economy, right? And they all suffered very substantial uh, economic downturns. But Ukraine had the worst uh, of the countries in the, in the western part. This chart is, it shows you a change in, in, it's called GDP per capita, that's basically uh, income per head, so the average income in the country, from 1990 to 2018. And what you see, so Ukraine is in, the, in this kind of red line, uh, Romania is the, the purple, and Poland is the blue, and then here's Russia in green, right? Um, the basic story is every, everyone lost a lot of income in the, in, the, in the early period. This is about, they all lost somewhere in the region of 10%. Uh, of their GDP. That's like the Great Recession uh, that we had. Um, no, it's about twice the Great Recession that we had in 2009. So it's pretty, pretty substantial. Um, Russia and, 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 and uh, uh, Ukraine lost economic growth of about 30% over, over the next four years. That's the Great Depression times two. Um, and then in the end, Ukraine suffered a, 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 a reduction in income of about half. Um, so that's the Great Depression of the 1930s times three, right? So this is a catastrophe, an absolute catastrophe. Now you can argue, and economists do argue, oh well, how reliable are the numbers, et cetera, et cetera. Fair enough, you can, you can debate this. There's <laughs> many academic journals where you can find article after article on it. Um, but the bottom line is that for ordinary people, there was an enormous contraction in their ability to, to, to feed themselves to dress themselves and to look after their families. Um, and for the rest, for most of the post-communist countries, like Poland, like Romania, it was pretty short-lived. Five or six, you know, five or six years is not that, that short a time, but within five or six years, they were back to more or less the same level of income that they had at the beginning of the transition process. For Russia and Belarus, it took 15 years, 12 to 15 years to get back to their level. And Ukraine sort of did it in, in 20 years and haven't really gotten much better since, right? So Ukraine has been the huge laggard uh, in that whole space. The reason that Ukraine has lagged so far behind is, two, is twofold. One, it doesn't have the natural resources that bailed Russia out. Um, and two, uh, it, is the, it has been the most corrupt of 
the countries in the, in the western part of the former Soviet Union. Its corruption uh, was such that it, the, the politics and the economy of the country was basically dominated by a small number of super rich individuals. We, we refer to them as oligarchs. You'll have heard the term. Some of them in uh, uh, metallurgy, some of them in, in producing uh, steel uh, in, in factories in the, in the far east of the country, some of them involved in trading of agricultural products, um, uh, some of them involved in, in, in production. One of the oligarchs we'll come back to in a, in a minute was made, it, made a fortune uh, establishing a huge chocolate empire. Um, uh, and so Ukrainian politics was basically corrupt and divided amongst these, these rich uh, men who paid for parliamentarians to write legislation that suited their personal interests. Right? They had nothing to do with long-run economic development in Ukraine. And not surprisingly, uh, ordinary Ukrainians suffered enormously uh, as a result. This meant that the sort of initial unity that we saw in Ukraine um, became very vulnerable to uh, exploitation by different uh, oligarchs and by different sort of, uh, not nationalism, but regionalism, ideas of different kinds of regional identity within the country, building upon this different history, uh, going back to the, before the, the Soviet period. Every election uh, after the first one, the first presidential election in 1993 in Ukraine, featured this very sharp divide between those who voted uh, for one set of candidates, predominantly in the south uh, and the east of the country, uh, and those who voted, and then the north and the west voted for different candidates. This particular election is the Ukrainian presidential election of 2004, when a guy called Viktor Yanukovych, remember that name because we'll come back to him. Um, who was uh, a gangster. Um, he served, served time in prison for, for racketeering um, from the city of Donetsk over here in eastern Ukraine. He had taken over, he used his money to take over the political machine uh, in Donetsk. And then he, he was attempting to basically move his Donetsk clan to take over the, the national government in Kiev by running for, for president. Uh, and he used his power and influence to gather votes in the East and the South. Um, uh, he used his power and influence, both kind of his patronage, but also appealed to uh, uh, affiliations with Russia. This part of the country is primarily Russian speaking. It certainly was then. Uh, and had large Russian uh, minority, ethnic Russian minority populations. Meanwhile, on the other side, another uh, Western Ukrainian oligarch, Viktor Yushchenko, uh, who was um, allied closely with, with uh, um, they called her, call her at the time the gas queen, uh, a woman called Yulia Timoshenko. You, you might, have, might have seen her. She had long blonde hair that was, she always wore it in, in, in braids, like a, like a kind of classical Ukrainian uh, peasant woman. She was very far from a peasant woman, um, one of the richest people in Ukraine. Uh, and they ran a campaign based on, on an idea of West Ukrainian identity uh, in contrast to the East Ukrainian uh, identity of, of Yanukovych. They're all mobsters, right? Um, this, all of this identity stuff was a political tool, essentially. What happened in 2004 was the election was basically a tie. Um, and Yanukovych claimed victory. And the parliament ratified his victory, but the Supreme Court refused to. Um, and there was a revolution. Um, Yushchenko, who had been poisoned by the Russians, he, this, you can't really see these pictures, but they had poisoned him. He used to be very handsome guy and, and, and in a matter of months using nerve agents, um, they made his face go green, uh, pockmarked, um, really, really pretty, pretty hideously disfigured. Um, raised protests against the, the, the election um, and persuaded the Supreme Court to, to, to declare that the election was void and that there should be another election. For many Ukrainians, this was a period, they called it, they called it the Orange Revolution. And this was a period in which the people rose up to throw out an oligarch, to throw out a criminal from power um, in the hope that the, they would replace him with someone who would rule in the interests of ordinary Ukrainians and not in the interests of a corrupt oligarchy. Um, they were disappointed. What happened after the Orange Revolution was that Yushchenko um, basically let business go on as it was, uh, took no real interest in anti-corruption measures, no real interest in any of the kind of political and, and, and judicial reforms uh, that Ukraine needed, but instead continued to pursue a sort of nationalist identity 
in which he uh, pardoned and made into national heroes figures who had fought on the side of the Nazis uh, for Ukraine's independence uh, in the Second World War, thus being incredibly divisive figures. So popular in, in the west, western part of Ukraine and hopelessly unpopular in the eastern part of Ukraine, but doing nothing to solve any of the fundamental issues that face Ukraine. So the Orange Revolution went nowhere. And division, political division endured. This was the next presidential election. Uh, after the, the Orange Revolution, we had Timoshenko, who I talked about before, running against our friend Yanukovych from Donetsk. This is in 2010. Uh, and this time, you get the same pattern. Totally divided country. Um, and this time, Yanukovych actually wins. Uh, and he becomes president of Ukraine. He now has the problem of running Ukraine. So talking about how you're going to run Ukraine and actually running Ukraine, two different things, right? Um, and so what he does is he tries to take Ukraine along a path in which he protects Ukraine's independence because if Ukraine is independent, he gets to be the, the head gangster, right, and steal the most. Um, at the same time, ap appealing to Russia uh, and keeping, keeping Putin on, on side. Um, and at the, at, the, at the other same time, going along with the West Europeans, with the European Union, uh, and having uh, talks about trade negotiations and trade deals, and eventually membership in the European Union. And so Yanukovych tries to, to walk this line, but it gets harder and harder and harder, and Putin gets more and more tired of it. And at the end of the day, puts his foot down and says, OK, all this talk of a trade deal with the EU, you've got to renounce it. You're going to join uh, what's called the Eurasian Customs Union, which is Eurasian Economic Union, sorry, which is a customs union with Russia, Belarus, uh, and Azerbaijan. Right? You're going to take your country's fate decisively in the direction of friendship with, with Russia at the expense of closer relations with the EU. This was not popular um, and led to a second revolution, a revolution that the Ukrainians call the Euromaidan revolution because it was Maidan is this main square in the, in the center of Kiev um, where the revolution took place. Uh, and the Euro part because it was about the adoption of uh, European values and integration into the European Union. They also call it something else, though. They call it the revolution of dignity. And they call it that because uh, early on in the revolution, when, when, when the numbers are pretty small, actually, just a few thousand people occupying the square in the center of Kiev, this is in 2013, the fall of 2013, um, the government of, of Yanukovych sent in uh, paramilitary forces um, called the Berkut. Um, to, to arrest the protesters, to beat them up, and to chase them out of the square. The response to that um, was not for the protesters to go home and, and, and disappear with their tails between their legs, but was for a following day 150,000 people to show up to defend the Maidan uh, and to uh, continue their revolution. And what happened over the course of this revolution uh, was increasingly repressive and violent repression on the part of the government increasing repressive legislation, making it legal uh, to protest, illegal to, to take part in the streets, which always was met with a huge reaction of more and more people coming out and responding and, and, and occupying the streets and marching, sometimes as many as a quarter of a million people marching through the center of, of Kiev, a city of a uh, population of roughly four million uh, people, people coming from all over the country, from, west of, from the western part of Ukraine, but also from the eastern part of Ukraine. Um, people of all political persuasions, there were quite famously at the time neo-Nazis in the square. There were also communists, there were also uh, liberals, uh, there were socialists, there were ca you know, capitalists, there were every single political stripe you could imagine who favored closer relations with Europe over a Russian allied role that they increasingly associated with the violence uh, and the inhumanity of the government of, of Yanukovych. Long story short, there was uh, shooting on the crowds. The crowds shot people, in the, some people in the crowd shot back. Um, and uh, Yanukovych's famous and feared Berkut security services, they ran away. Um, and Yanukovych himself also ran away and fled to Russia, uh, where he took asylum, um, leaving his palaces uh, to be opened by the people, where the true hideousness of his, his, his excess um, and, and, and wasteful spending in, in, in one of the poorest countries in Europe um, was laid bare for everybody. 
Um, this Euromaidan revolution, revolution of dignity, co constituted a really remarkable change in the political direction of Ukraine. But it also constituted a remarkable change in the cultural uh, direction of Ukraine and the nature of, of, of politics and the nature of citizens' engagement with their country uh, and with their communities. And I've been blessed over the last, uh, what is it now, eight years uh, to work on a lot of projects in Ukraine, mostly for, for USAID, for the, for the American Development Agency, um, helping to move that civil society revolution that started in the Maidan forward and to consolidate it uh, and to build institutions around it uh, to support it. And I want to talk a little bit about the cultural and political revolution that's taking place, which I think is the key to understanding how the war has gone in Ukraine. It's the key to understanding what a mistake Putin made, his lack of understanding, his, the failure to look at what's actually going on in Ukraine um, uh, explains a, a lot. Um, I should say at the same time as the, as the revolution, uh, the R Russians took advantage of the turmoil of the revolution to seize Crimea using uh, Russian military, um, uh, first, first without any insignia on and then later more openly uh, as Russian soldiers. They managed to take that without a fight. This is really important for them strategically because of this city here, the city of Sevastopol, um, which is where the Russian Black Sea fleet is, is based. If you can get into the Black Sea, you can get out through the Dardanelles into the, into the Mediterranean and, you're, and you're, into, you're, off, right? you're off to the world. So Russia could run its submarines, uh, its warships, uh, et cetera, out of there. This is the only warm water port that they have. Um, so strategically, it was incredibly important. And it wasn't a super big surprise, I guess, to many that they took advantage of what happened in, in, in the revolution uh, to, to seize Crimea. But they also sponsored revolutions in Luhansk, Ukraine is called it, Lugansk, the Russians call it, uh, and, and, and Donetsk. Cities in regions in, in the eastern part of Ukraine that were heavily based on uh, uh, coal mining uh, and metallurgy, steel making, uh, and, and, and that kind of production. Uh, and they fought to try and extend those regions that they occupied to include the port city of Mariupol uh, unsuccessfully. Um, and essentially, the war that we see today, Ukrainians will tell you, began eight years ago, began uh, in 2014 when Russia annexed Crimea and when it took those territories uh, in eastern Ukraine. So when, when, I, when I say to, Russia, to Ukrainian friends, when I refer to the invasion that, as beginning on February the 24th, they, they just laugh and say, well, you would say that because you've not been fighting for eight years. We've been fighting for eight years, right? And that, again, is a really important factor in explaining and understanding why the war has gone the way it has. So the civil society revolution, the, the, the great growth in civil society that took place uh, in Ukraine um, had a number of different forms. One was the, was the creation of organizations like this one. It's called the Reanimation Package of Reforms. Uh, who produced a, a very extensive roadmap of the kinds of political, economic, judicial, uh, legal, linguistic reforms that Ukraine needed. The cool thing about the Maidan revolution was it started in November and didn't finish until February. And while there was a lot of fighting and violence, you know, most of the time people were sitting around with nothing to do. Um, and so what they did was all these civil society activists who came to the Maidan sat down and wrote legislation for what they were, how they were going to reform Ukraine in the period once they won the revolution. So unlike most revolutionaries who seize the power, you know, get into the capital, and the, into the, you know, the palace, and then look around trying to decide what to do and who's going to be in charge, the Ukrainian revolutionaries already had a plan, a very clearly enumerated plan um, that covered all sorts of different reforms in society. That's a first uh, of any revolution that I know of, um, and uh, really makes Ukraine a, a very, a completely unique uh, case um, of revolution around, around the world. But the other thing that happened, and, and my own survey research that started back in, before the Maidan in 2012 um, shows this, the other thing that happened is Ukrainians who before had been ambivalent about their Ukrainian identity, about their, their, their connection with Ukraine, many of them uh, who spoke Russian uh, or were ethnic Russians and who lived in the eastern part of Ukraine, um, began to side much more strongly, much more self-consciously with Ukraine um, itself and with, with their Ukrainian identity. They may still speak Russian, um, but they didn't see that in any way as being contradictory to being a supporter of the revolution uh, and a patriotic Ukrainian. 
Um, and that, again, was a, was, is, is, is a first um, and a big change on what had happened in Ukraine until uh, the Euromaidan. It became really important uh, for the resistance that we've seen uh, to, to, to Russian invasion. The first election after the Maidan Revolution, um, the, the, the chocolate king that I mentioned a while ago, Petro Poroshenko, used his money to win the election. Um, and he won the election with pretty much the same old setup. Votes from Western Ukraine uh, on the one hand against the losing candidates drew their votes from, from, from Eastern Ukraine. Not much had changed. And Poroshenko ruled as though uh, as, as, though, as though nothing had changed, and he didn't particularly want anything to change. So this new movement of, the, of, of reforms, um, he paid lip service to, he talked about it a lot, um, but he tried to put key uh, placement in, 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 in different parts of the government to make sure that they could stymie and block any serious reform efforts. And so it looked like um, up until uh, uh, 2017 um, that uh, the efforts of the revolution were going to fail again, that it was going to be another um, uh, orange revolution where everyone rose up but nothing really changed. Um, this turned out not to be true. Um, and in the next presidential election, uh, which took place in, in 2019, we saw a complete transformation of the Ukrainian polity. This transformation was in part due to the work of the civil society organizations, but it was also due to the emergence of a new candidate um, of a TV uh, star who became president, right? Um, always a bit of a gamble. Uh, um, but this TV star who became president had starred on, a, uh, starred on a TV show in which he played the president. He played a school teacher um, who gave a, a, a rousing speech against corruption in his school classroom. Um, the kids all rose up and, and you know, he kind of went from there to the older political movement and became president on this anti-corruption. And he created a new party called Servant of the People, which was the same name as his show. Um, uh, you can show, we've done shown this in surveys, that people who watched the show were much more likely to vote for him um, than people who hadn't watched the show. So free advertising is great. Um, and he could already, everyone could already imagine him as president because they had seen him, right? But he created this new political party that went along with um, him in which you were banned from joining it. You were banned as a candidate uh, if you had held any political office before at all. So it was a completely new set of individuals, many, many, which is kind of risky, right? It, that, that's, you know, it, totally inexperienced people coming into, into power. But many of them were not t actually totally inexperienced. They had had a lot of work before in the civil society organizations uh, that I talked about a minute ago. So they were experienced in terms of policy. They were just not corrupted uh, in terms of, uh, of politics. Moreover, uh, Zelensky himself, is a, is a, you've probably heard this, is a, was brought up as a Russian speaker. Um, he was Jewish, uh, and yet he portrayed himself and campaigned as a highly patriotic Ukrainian, thus making those two identities, which had not always been uh, highly compatible with patriotism in Ukraine, making them you know, absolutely mainstream and, 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 and okay. And that's a really huge development as well, and encouraged others, I think, to really get on the, on the train of, their, of the Ukrainian identity. So this election in which you know, Zelensky won almost the whole country. Right? You see the contrast between these large red areas and only this tiny area of where Poroshenko um, has oh, disappeared, just like that, um, between the two elections. Um, and so you have this real transformation between the, between the two eras. Um, so that's Ukraine on the eve of what we now know as the Russian invasion. Uh, of, of, of February the 24th. A country that's united more than it had ever been. A country that still has plenty of problems. A country that was still very poor, less than half the GDP of, 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 of Russia. But a country that was in, engaged upon a new identity. A country that was hardened by eight years of war. Um, when the Russians first invaded in 2014, the Ukrainians didn't really have an army because they'd, all the money that had been spent on the army over the previous decade had been stolen. And so they had supposed to have bought this and supposed to have bought that, and then when they went to the, you know, the warehouses to see where all these bullets were, there, were, there weren't any there, right, because the money for them had been stolen. But they'd spent the last eight years building that army up. They'd spent the last eight years getting extensive assistance from the United States, 
Um, I had a number of students who were US Special Forces officers who went to Ukraine. Uh, and every time they came back, they would say, oh, well, you know, Graham, there's, I say, how many, how many Americans are in Ukraine? And they would say, well, Graham, I can't tell you. But it's more than you think. Um, and we had a very substantial presence there and put a lot of effort into training Ukraine uh, up for, for what, what they thought was the coming conflict. Right? Um, and so when the Russians invaded, had the Russians spent, I, I, joke, I joke, had, had Putin spent 10 minutes on the internet, he would have learned that Ukraine was a different place than the kind of Ukraine that they were telling him in his security reports. Putin doesn't use the internet, so <laughs> um, there's a lesson for us all there. But he, they felt that they would walk into Ukraine and be greeted uh, with open arms by an oppressed population uh, who weren't really at all attached to being Ukrainians and would rather be Russians anyway. Couldn't be further from the truth. And anybody who had spent any time in Ukraine knew that. Um, the Western military analysts said the Russians would steamroll into Kiev. Um, I'm not a military analyst, so when I wrote about this back in December, before the war started, um, I didn't say that, oh no, they won't steamroll into Kiev. I said, if they do steamroll into Kiev, the problems only begin, because they're gonna have to hold this country, this huge country the size of France, um, where the vast majority of the population uh, is gonna be completely opposed and find this uh, invasion intolerable. Um, you know, and, and you know, the, 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 what, you, what you saw probably at the beginning of the war was this mass manufacture by citizens of, of, of Molotov cocktails. Uh, and the instructions on how to make Molotov cocktails were everywhere on the, on the internet. Um, you know, friends of mine who are people of, of a certain age were all of a sudden starting to learn how to make Molotov cocktails. Um, uh, and so, you know, like, the resistance was, that, that there would be massive resistance was clear to everybody uh, who cared to, to really look into this. Um, and as a result, the Russian uh, advance into Ukraine has really stalled. Um, and I think it's turned out to be very different from what they were expecting to find when they got there. Their assault, for example, down here from the north, from, from Belarus into Kiev, never quite made it. The Ukrainians blew up all the bridges uh, on the roads on the, on, uh, down towards uh, Kiev, which the Russians have been planning on using, because when they invaded, it was what they call mud season. Right, so this, 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 the, the ice, the snow had melted, uh, and the tanks really, they had to use roads, they couldn't go across fields. Uh, and so the Ukrainians sabotaged all the bridges on the way, and the Russians very quickly got stuck. And you probably heard about this 40 mile, alo mile long um, convoy that just seemed to get bigger and bigger and bigger and never go anywhere. Well, it couldn't go anywhere because there were no bridges for it to go over. And then it became a sitting duck for Ukrainian resistance. So they absolutely failed uh, in, in, in their efforts to take Kiev. They failed in the east to take the, 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 the very large city, uh, Ukraine's second largest city, now that Donetsk, if you don't count Donetsk, um, failed to take that. And they even failed to really advance out of the positions that they'd already held for eight years. Where they were super successful was coming out of Crimea and taking the southern coast. And you'll read some observers to say that this constitutes Success for the Russians because it cuts Ukraine off effectively from the Black Sea, especially if they can get to the port of Odessa. Right? And that would be a disaster for Ukraine. It really would effectively turn them into a landlocked uh, country and one that's surrounded not just on three sides by Russia, but, but you know, kind of three and a half. Um, uh, so they've had some success in the south, but, but really, um, as you see there by their failed attempts to take even the city of Mariupol, which supposedly is a Russian-speaking city, which supposedly would have welcomed, if anyone would have welcomed the Russian uh, troops, Mariupol would have been the city that would have welcomed them. Absolutely not. You've seen this incredibly solid resistance. Um, so while I've started to see people say, oh, well, this is all part of the plan, where they're only, only gonna take the south because that gives them access to Ukraine's oil and gas reserves, um, I think that's bunk. I think clearly they were trying to do a much larger invasion, and now they're backing off and trying to work out what they can get as a plan B. Um, and even if they do hold this part, and even if it does give them access to oil and gas in the Black Sea and the Sea of Azov, the price they're paying for it in sanctions uh, just makes it not, not worth it. Um, a, a complete disaster in, in, in my view. Um, some other things have happened that the Russians wouldn't have wanted to see. Zelensky, who when he was elected had, a, this is, I'm gonna show you a bunch of charts that are in Ukrainian, I haven't had time to to translate them yet, but I'll tell you 
basically what it means. This is the popularity of the Zelensky. Um, and the green line is, is people who approve uh, of Zelensky and his actions. And so when he was first elected, he had approval about 70%. The honeymoon period lasted a little while, and then like all politicians, he started to wear off on people. Um, and then sort of stabilized around 30 to 40%, which is not great um, from his perspective. But given his uh, staunch resistance against the Russians and his amazing communication skills as a war leader, he's bounced up to 93% to be almost unanimously popular amongst uh, his people. These surveys, I should say, are made by a Ukrainian organization called the Rating Group, um, which are continuing to poll uh, even as the war is going on. Um, one of the goals of the invasion is to stop Ukraine joining the European Union. So this blue line shows support for joining the European Union in Ukraine back to basically the Euromaidan era. It's around mid-50s to 60%. You know, stays more or less there, goes up to about 60 for a little while, and then Russians invade, and now 86% of people want to join the European Union, so that didn't really help very much. Um, this is the same thing, but for application for, for NATO. Um, again, sort of around 40%, a little less popular than the European Union until the invasion, uh, and now three quarters of Ukrainians say uh, that, that they want their country to, to become a member of NATO. So very much the opposite of what um, they were ex the Russians were expecting. And then finally, if you ask Ukrainians about um, uh, would you be willing to take up arms to defend the territorial integrity of Ukraine? So in some sense, the sort of the ultimate question of patriotism, the ultimate question of, of, of civil, civic duty. Um, the results were really interesting. So ratings started asking this back in 2010. The green boxes are people would say yes. You know, absolutely is the dark green, and probably yes is the, the light green. So you get roughly about 40%. And then bef just before the, the Orange Revolution, before the Euromaidan Revolution, it drops to only a third of people say that either probably or definitely would uh, take up arms to defend their country. Pretty bad, I think, actually. Um, uh, and then after the revolution, it's around 50%, and it's sort of growing, but pretty slowly. Now, if you ask Ukrainians, you get 80% of people say they're willing to do it. And you don't have to take them at their word. At, you, you can see by their deeds. Uh, what they've done. Um, women and children have uh, constituted the vast majority of the people, of the, of the 10 million refugees uh, and internally displaced people that have left their homes in Ukraine and the two or three million that have left Ukraine entirely. Um, but many women and many children and almost all the men have stayed behind to organize the resistance and to fight. So you don't need to, this is one of these times when you have a polling question and you have a behavior, right, and you can see that they, people are serious when they're talking about this. Um, yeah, this, this one is really wacky as well. Um, this is the, uh, a question that they started asking about how confident are you that Ukraine is going to repel the Russian attack, right? So at the start of the war, about 56% of people thought that Ukraine would successfully resist. 0% of Western analysts thought <laughs> Ukraine would successfully resist milit military, at least in the first instance of the military analysts. Um, so the Ukrainian people were much more optimistic. Now, just last week, 93% of Ukrainians were either very confident or, or, or you know, absolutely certain or, or very confident that Ukraine would win militarily. And if you ask them other questions about how long you think it's going to take, most people say a matter of weeks. So morale, rightly or wrongly, and unfortunately this is where I think probably wrongly, uh, amongst Ukrainians is extremely high. So they're united, they're organized, uh, they are standing firm, um, they are more pro-European, they are more pro-NATO, uh, and they're more unified behind their government than, uh, than anyone would have imagined than before the war was possible. None of these goals were things that Putin was trying to achieve. Uh, in fact, he was after the opposite. So this strikes me as, as, you know, this whole war has been a really catastrophic uh, disaster. I want to take just a couple of minutes at the end to talk about the catastrophic disaster on the other side uh, of the border, which is what's happened in Russia. What we've seen in Russia um, is tremendous violence against those opposed to the war. Some 17,000 protesters have been arrested in Russia since the start of the war. Um, it was one of the most moving arrests that I saw recently was a young woman uh, standing outside a church 
um, with a piece of paper on her own, right? So it, it's, it's legal to protest on your own in Russia. It's not legal if there's two of you. Or it's legal if there's only one of you. Uh, and she's standing there with a, with a piece of paper um, saying, thou shalt not kill, right? So a woman with a, with a biblical quote standing outside a church and arrested for an anti-war demonstration right? and, and beaten. Um, so, Ru so Russia has been incredibly repressive. New laws have been passed to make it illegal to even refer to what's happening in Ukraine as a war, right? Uh, it's a special military o occupation or it's a denazification. Um, and all the independent voices that, that, that have been uh, really brave and really uh, uh, important during uh, Putin's increasingly repressive regime over the last 20 years have now been shut down. Um, even the editor of this is the editor of a newspaper called Nova Gazeta, which recently won the Nobel Prize for peace for its reporting from Russia, even under difficult circumstances, has shut itself down on Monday because it was no longer able to operate uh, under the government's uh, restrictions. And then the third thing that's happened in Russia has been mass emigra emigration, mass departure of educated people, of young people, a huge brain drain um, the, of the size that will uh, cause historic damage to Russia uh, and will always be remembered and by, by historians as the day when um, all those who, who, who represented, a, who wanted a different future uh, and could leave, left. Um, uh, and so this is incredibly damaging in the long run for the, for the Russian economy, for Russian society. And at the same time, Russia has become an international pariah as well, subject to sanctions from the United States, from Europe, uh, from Australia, from Japan, from South Korea, from all around uh, the world. And this will have very long-term economic consequences. Once companies leave um, a country, they're slow to come back in general, um, and especially the range of companies that have left Russia. I want to make sure we have time for, for some discussion and questions. Um, there's some, looking ahead, there's a bunch of questions we could talk about. How likely is there a, negoti a negotiated settlement? What it might look like? How long can Putin survive the his own destruction of his, his own country? Um, but the question I want to focus on is, is the question of how can I help? Um, the main thing that people in, the West, in, in, in North Carolina can do, I think there's two things that you can do. One is to donate money to support uh, the, 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 the war effort um, and internally displaced people and women and children and refugees. There are lots of different ways to do this. Um, my preferred charity is, is called Razom, which is the Ukrainian word for together, for ukraine.org. Um, they're, they're a locally based uh, Ukrainian organization that emerged out of uh, the Euromaidan revolution, so they've been around a long time. Uh, they are very um, efficient in the money. Sorry? They're very, they're very uh, helpful, uh, so very uh, uh, effective because they've got deep roots in the communities and they use all the money that you donate, uh, uh, go straight to their causes, none sort of wasted on international consultants or, or anything like that. Um, if you don't get a chance to get that done and you and feel, feel free to uh, ask me afterwards or, or send me an email or uh, some other, get in touch with, with me. Um, this is a great organization. Um, I want to pause there and say thank you for your attention um, and, and uh, I look forward to the conversation. If you have a question, if you'll just raise your hand and I'll come to you. What do you think about the recent information we've been hearing that Putin has been misinformed and that he did not have benefit of um, understanding just what's going on with the military? So, so this is information coming out from the, from the US intelligence saying that, that Putin has been systematically misinformed by his military and he's very upset about it. Um, the US has been waging a very effective information war against Russia and this is part of that. You know, to turn around and say, you know, portray Putin as, as out of touch and, and, um, and also to create dissension within the, the upper ranks of the, of the Russian military. So just as I wouldn't trust what they say, I wouldn't take at face value either what we're saying. And, and we shouldn't be, you know, saying the truth all the time, right? This is, this is a war, right? So we have to be careful and, and strategic. That said, um, it, it seems to me that it's, it's true. It seems to me that, you know, 
I wrote in the, with, with my colleague Sam Green in the Washington Post on the 9th of December um, that invading Ukraine would be a disaster, that Ukraine would resist, that the West would, would unite, that you'd have enormous sanctions and Russia would be crippled. Even, even if it were able to be successful militarily, it would never be successful in governing Ukraine. It wouldn't be able to find uh, uh, you know, uh, people who would govern for it. It wouldn't be able to find puppets to stand and it would be a total disaster. That's proven to be true. And if it was obvious to me sitting in Chapel Hill, surely Putin could have known about it, right? Um, and so the only explanation for that is that he was misinformed um, or crazy. And I don't really buy the crazy part. I don't know. Um, uh, but I think it's, it's always unwise to assume your, your opponent has is, is, is lost his mind. Um, uh, and so I, I think there is pretty good evidence to suggest, listen, the, the military tactics were, 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 were very um, different from the kinds of military tactics that Western analysts had expected um, of a, a Russian invasion. They expected really close coordination between air attacks and then followed by ground forces coming in, 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 in battle groups that consisted of different kinds of, of, of weaponry, motorized and, 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 and infantry. And that's not what we saw. We saw these long, uh, ex un undefended tank runs towards Kiev, the kind of thing that, that actually the United States did uh, in both of the Iraq wars, um, but did successfully because the Iraqi opposition melted away. Um, so they were expecting the same thing to happen, and it, it didn't. Um, and so again, that speaks to me to be you know, just like really poor intelligence. Does anybody else have a question? Can you give us a little insight into Putin and why he did this? And what's to come? I mean, is he going to take over other countries? Um, just a little bit about Putin. Yeah, so I'm always very wary about giving insight into the psychology of people that I've never met. <laughs> and even, even if I've you know, read a ton about this guy, I know his, his life story back to front, I've written about his life story extensively. What really makes somebody tick um, you know, only some, only your psychotherapist knows, right? Quite often, you yourself don't really know. Um, so, with that said, I'll now go and tell you what I think. Um, but m my, my guess is that what's happened over time is he was a very astute guy, um, a very cynical guy, um, a guy who you know um, was clearly not loved by his parents. He, he when he talks about his childhood, it's all about the week getting beaten uh, and how rough things were. Um, and you know, a very hard person. Um, and over the years, he's become increasingly isolated, increasingly alone. Uh, you know, uh, he doesn't even, he's not even rumored to have girlfriends anymore. Like he's really got nobody in his entourage, apart from uh, a couple of old friends and uh, some, and, and there, everyone else is, 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 is a sycophant. Um, uh, surrounding him. Uh, and then COVID just turned that up to 11, right? Um, and you see these crazy pictures where he's sitting at this table 20 meters away from the, the only other person in the room, right? At the other end of the table. Um, so he's become, uh, I, w I wouldn't say paranoid, but I would say very detached from reality and increasingly uh, interested in something which he's always been interested in, which is you know, making Russia great again. Um, and, and the way he sees that is, 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 is uh, re reclaiming territories uh, that used to be part of the Russian Empire. Uh, and Ukraine is the number one case of that, especially Eastern Ukraine. And so that's my you know, armchair speculation, really, of, of his uh, psychological development. But I wouldn't you know, call it much more than uh, informed armchair speculation. There's so much news out there. Um, can you give us reliable um, news that we can follow to cover um, that covers the war and what's all going on? Because you just see so much out yeah. there. Yeah, it's really hard, isn't it? And 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 and, and it's gotten uh, harder and harder. As I, I I get most of my news from uh, from from, from a, a social media platform called Telegram, uh, where I follow Ukrainian journalists. Um, but for in, in, in English, the, I've been really 
Over the years, I've been very critical of the New York Times' coverage of Russia, um, where I found it to be quite anti-Russian in, in ways that were not helpful. Um, but their coverage of the war has been fantastic, really, really first rate. So, so I, I, you can put a fair amount of trust in, in, in there. Um, the British news, online newspaper, The Guardian, is also, is also pretty good. Um, and then there's an English language uh, newspaper called the Moscow Times, uh, which is really excellent and provides a kind of Russia perspective on, but not a Russian government perspective, but a perspective from independent journalists in Moscow. So those three sources are pretty useful, I think, at this point. Yeah. Sir, the news reports that we receive now make Putin seem hardly rational. Um, there's some kind of a magic wand if the Ukrainian situation did not exist. Do you think we'd still be seeing the decline in Putin's mental faculties? He seems to be sliding backwards as fast as he can go. Yeah, I don't know. I like I say, I, I, it, I think it's really hard to tell without you know, actually interviewing him and, and hanging out with him for a while. Um, and I haven't done that, so I don't, I don't really know. Um, what I do know is that his domestic popularity, which was fading, has always gone up when there's been conflict with the West. Um, and so doing something like this would have been, is, is consistent with, it's in that sense, with his previous behavior. What's not consistent with his previous behavior is doing it in this open public way. When the Russians have interfered elsewhere, it's always been using either soldiers who did not carry, wear Russia insignia until after they had won, or using uh, mercenaries, private security forces, um, or using sabotage or, 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 or uh, uh, cyber attacks. And so it all had deniability until they win, and then they can say, okay, we did this thing. And this has not been like that at all. This was like, okay, come world here with 300,000 soldiers on the border. That's very, very different from his behavior in the past. Um, and that's, I don't know what that means about his mental health, but, it, but it's certainly a change in behavior that's radical. Yeah. Is, is the United States doing enough to help? The sanctions to me seem a little abstract. I, I guess I want to see more military power, more force, but I don't. Right, so, so most Ukrainians think not. Um, the sanctions have had a d devastating effect on the Russian economy. Um, in particular, the sanctions against the Russian Central Bank, which you know, destroyed the ruble overnight. The ruble has actually gotten, gotten almost all its value back, which is super interesting, and I don't actually understand why. Um, that's kind of on my to-do list for this weekend, just to work out what's going on with that. Um, uh, but they've had a devastating effect on the Russian economy, and they've, they've really crushed the oligarchs in Russia, who have become increasingly weak over time anyway, but, but and, and it's highlighted their weakness because they're all complaining and they're being ignored. Right? Um, I wouldn't shed a tear for those guys, but anyway. Um, what we have done uh, in terms of providing uh, military equipment to Ukraine has been really good. We've been a little slow with uh, air defense uh, support, um, but what the Ukrainians really want is a no-fly zone. Um, and, you know, I understand why they really want it. I understand why we don't do it. Because to do that means, it doesn't mean just flying around airplanes above the sky of Ukraine. It means attacking Russian air defense systems in Ukraine and in Russia. Um, so it means going to war with Russia. Um, Russia has nuclear weapons. Uh, so it means a very, very, very unpredictable escalation. And I think the Biden administration has been so far sensible to resist the demands for that, which have been pretty loud. Where we could do a lot more is in the realm of displaced people. Uh, there are three million uh, Ukrainians now in Poland, uh, and the government, the US government has uh, approved 500,000 uh, uh, visas uh, for reuniting families. So you have, have to have family already in the United States for Ukrainians. And that's just not going to be enough. Um, over time, uh, especially if this war goes on for any length of time, we're going to have to deal, Poland can't handle three million refugees. Um, and you know, for the most part, um, the other countries around them are even worse equipped uh, to handle them than Poland. Uh, and the United States has large Ukrainian communities, especially in different parts of the Midwest. 
Um, many will go to Canada. Canada has a huge Ukrainian population. But we need to do more on that front, and we need to be more supportive. And we need to put in systems. So th these are primarily women and children that are uh, leaving. Um, and their you know, refugees are always vulnerable to exploitation, um, and women and children in particular. Uh, and so we need to put in place not just family reunification programs, but programs that, that provide safe places for, uh, for these refugees to go. Uh, so I wanted to ask about the speculation of the Russian war crimes and if you could provide any input on the accuracy of that statement. Ah, <laughs> I'm trying and, to find um, <laughs> If there would be any legal ramifications. Yeah, so um, there will be. And let me tell you why I think so. The, the, the idea now that Vladimir Putin is going to end up in the court in The Hague or that any of his senior generals are gonna end up in court in The Hague, seems impossible, right? Um, how on earth would that happen? In the early 1990s, 1991, 92, I had my first job out of college, and I worked in the peace conference on the former Yugoslavia, negotiating between Serbia, Croatia, and over the war, and, and, and Bosnia, over the war in Bosnia. Uh, and the leadership, the president of Serbia at that time was a guy called Slobodan Milosevic. Uh, and the, the, the head of the Bosnian Serbs was a guy called Radovan Karadzic. Um, those guys were evil monsters. Uh, and we all wanted to see them go uh, to, to the Hague, to go to prison, to go to trial for their war crimes, which were obvious and well known. But we, I, we thought it was impossible. Even as an idealistic 22-year-old, I thought this was impossible, and it would never happen. 20 years later, as a less idealistic 42-year-old, Slobodan Milosevic died in prison in the Hague. Um, Yadavan Karadzic was, was arrested, convicted, and is still in prison in The Hague. It took 20 years, but it happened. Today, as I was driving here, I heard about uh, a commander in Darfur, Sudan, a, a leader of a, of, a, of a band called the, the, the Janjaweed, that some of people might remember, were terrorizing and murdering people in Sudan 17 years ago, made his first appearance in court in The Hague today, charged with war crimes. There is a lot of evidence of war crimes uh, in Russia, in, uh, in Ukraine. It is so hard to commit war crimes these days without people knowing about it. We, with colleagues at Duke uh, and the University of Manchester in, in, in England, we have been collecting terabytes of, of, of tweets um, coming out of Ukraine uh, that are classified fo focusing on human rights violations and war crimes. So just in Chapel Hill, we have a huge archive that will be a, a, a gold mine for people investigating war crimes in the future. Um, and so what will happen will happen. We will gather evidence, lawyers will gather evidence, cases will be built, and one day um, some of these people, and hopefully Putin himself, will end up uh, in The Hague. Your first bullet point, how likely is uh, some type of a settlement? What's the, what's the end game look like? Yeah, so this is, this is why I'm depressed about it. <laughs> so I'll give you a fairly upbeat kind of story, right? The story of this plucky country standing up and uniting itself and, and fighting back, and that's all true. But the problem is, what's the end game here? And what's acceptable? And if you look at those polling numbers about how optimistic Ukrainians are that they're going to win, there's also other polling that suggests that then, consequently, they're not willing to make any concessions, right? They're not willing to give them Crimea. They're not willing to give them Don the Donbass. They're willing to talk about neutrality, depending on what we mean by neutrality, and the way they currently mean neutrality is, okay, we won't be in NATO, but the NATO countries will guarantee our, our security and independence, right? Contractually, whether that would work, I don't know. But it certainly wouldn't be acceptable to Moscow. Moscow, on the other hand, uh, says it's willing to recognize uh, Ukraine if Ukraine uh, demilitarizes, which, whatever that means, and, 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 and denazifies, whatever that means, right? So that's just made up stuff, which suggests to me they're not serious about negotiating. They don't agree with what, with what the word Ukraine even means, right? So they assume that Ukraine does not include Crimea. It does not include Donetsk and Lugansk, right? So they can't even agree at this point over what Ukraine is. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm pretty skeptical from what I'm hearing right now that there's any language that, 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 that looks like a real path. The other reason that I'm skeptical at this point, it goes again back to my experience in the war in Yugoslavia. Every time the Serbs were having problems on the battlefield, 
they became much more warm and much more energetic in the negotiating uh, halls in, in, in Brussels and Geneva. Um, and then they would get sort out whatever supply problems they were having and go back to fighting again. Um, and that looks to me like what Russia's doing right now. Um, that sort of rhetoric of you know, blowing hot and cold um, in negotiations as a function of their success on the battlefield um, and stringing things out and making it go on just looks very, very familiar. Um, and so I'm, I'm very uh, pessimistic about there being a deal in the, in the short term. Um, and, and what it would look like, Putin must be defeated, um, but he also needs to walk away with something. Um, and I'm not clear he would be willing to walk away with just Crimea, Donetsk, and, and, and neutrality, even if the Ukrainians were willing to give it. Um, so I think, I think the prospects for a, a settlement are, 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 are not great. And the prospects for you know, a victorious Ukrainian counteroffensive are also not great. Um, and so I think, we, sadly, we might be stuck in this kind of situation for quite a while. I'm a retired teacher here in, uh, in this area, but I'm concerned about the youth and the, the young people in the educational system and what is happening. Is there a breakdown, complete breakdown in it, trying to uh, help the children to learn what's going on and so that they can have an education. It, it bothers me that everything's all torn up and sure. there's no wonder what they can do now. Yeah, I think you're right. I, I, first of all, I have two kids in the public schools in North Carolina and I love public school teachers, so thank you for your, for your work. Um, I am, uh, it's hard to even talk about it. You know, there are millions and millions of children um, who are, are, are displaced. Um, they're arriving in, in camps in, in, in Poland. They're, um, some of them are actually getting into public schools in Poland um, and getting some education. But Polish and Ukrainian, they're, they're, they're not the same language. They're not even close. You know, they're sort of close, but they're close, like, like I don't know, like, like English and German, you know? So they're, they're not, it's not that, they're not into, mutually comprehensible. So I, how that is going to operate, I don't know. Um, and then sort of integrating those kids, you know, the kids of many of them have been through very traumatic experiences, um, through hiding in bomb shelters, through hearing air raid shelters. Um, uh, you know, these things are, you know, make a big difference in a, in a child's life. And so um, how to recover from that is, is going to be an enormous task. The other young people that I'm very worried about are, are young people in Russia. If you look at surveys in Russia about support for the war, um, some of which I've run myself, what you find is that um, you know, the, the majority of Russians say they support the war. Whether they do or not is a little bit tricky since call, even calling it a war can get you 15 years. So there's, there's a lot of, you know, uh, you look at the polls, a lot of caution. But uh, young people in Russia don't support the war. Um, there uh, is, a, a very, by very large majorities, they oppose it. Uh, and their futures are being thrown away. Russia has been cut off from the rest of the world. Independent voices in Russia are being cut off. Um, the education system in Russia already for, for some time now um, has become uh, more about political indoctrination than about real education. Um, and that's a, that's a tragedy, um, a country of 150 million people. Um, and so the, it, it's their, their futures also uh, are really something to, to, to be concerned about. Actually, you just answered my question. I was going to ask about the youth, uh, mainly college students in Russia, and all these guys. I know these guys are advocating for Ukraine, and I know Russians that have studied in the United States are talking on behalf of Ukraine, but I was curious about Russian college students. But I think you just answered that. Maybe. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of great Russians in the, in, 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 you know, we've been to a number of uh, uh, rallies in, in, in Raleigh. Um, uh, on, on behalf of the Ukrainian community in, in, in North Carolina. Um, and there's always a big population of people from Russia there, um, completely opposed to the war, completely supportive uh, of Ukraine. It's really important at, at this time um, that we don't make the error of thinking all Russians are the same, that we don't turn Russians into the enemy. Um, Putin is the enemy, 
the Russian state right now is the enemy, but the Russian people are not. Um, and it's really important to, to remember that. We're gonna take two more questions. The next one is from um, Anna, your former student. Um, my question is about, sorry, the pollen has really gotten me today. Um, my question is about Lukashenko. Mm -hmm. What does he stand to gain from, I don't know, he's a really interesting character to me and it seems like if Russia wanted more land or more people, they would just, Belarus would just say, yeah, come on, because we are your ardent supporters always, it seems like. Um, what does Lukashenko stand to gain from supporting Putin and letting the army, um, mm -hmm. letting the Belarusian army um, support this war? And is he really, or is that just a, it seems like that? Yeah, so Lukashenko is the, is the president of, of Belarus, um, and which is a big country to, 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 to the west of Russia. He has, he's, he's a dictator, he's a very, very, very nasty guy. Um, uh, and for a long time, he, he has kind of tried to play Russia off against the West, so he would get close to the Europeans in order to get money out of the Russians, and then, and then he would get close to the Russians in order to get money and concessions out of the Europeans, or get the Europeans to recognize his elections as being free and fair when they really weren't. Um, and so he's played this game backwards and forwards. I think he took office in 1994, so <laughs> he's been around for a really long time and has played this game really well. But last year, well, 2020, um, he had elections and they were the most fraudulent elections uh, in Belarusian history and there were huge protests, some of you might remember, 200,000 people on the streets of the capital Minsk. Um, and uh, his regime look, really looked like it might get overthrown. Uh, and then the Russians came in and provided him with more money, with security forces, uh, with more training and, and really basically helped him to stamp out or force into exile uh, the opposition movement. And since then, he's kind of been stuck because he really had to, Putin really bailed him out and he's now really become, to all intents and purposes, Putin's puppet. And so when the Russians decided they were gonna move 200,000 troops into Belarus, I don't think they asked. <laughs> I think they told him, you know. Um, uh, and so he's in an incredibly weak position now. Um, I wouldn't be too surprised if he was one of the people who became a casualty uh, and, and the Russians found somebody else to replace him. Um, before before too long. Does anybody help? We'll take one more question. Okay. What would be the impact of a potential misgrowing season in Ukraine on Europe and, and the rest of the world? What would be the impact? Sorry, I didn't catch A misgrowing season. Of? Growing, agri agricultural growing season. Oh, a misgrowing season. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's, that's huge. Um, I mentioned earlier on that 40% of uh, uh, the world's grain exports come out of the ports on the southern part of Ukraine, uh, growing in, in, in Russia and, and Ukraine. Uh, sunflower oil, uh, another massive, massive pr proportion of that, vegetable oils in general. Uh, corn, um, these, these all come very predominantly from uh, Ukraine and, and, and the southern part of Russia. Uh, and effectively, we're gonna miss a whole year, as you, as you say, um, and, and maybe more, right? I'm not an agriculturalist, but I imagine if you don't plant, there's other things you gotta do this year to prepare for next year. Um, the first effect is a huge increase in the price of bread. Um, and this has enormous implications, especially in Africa, um, where they get their bread supply predominantly from, uh, from Russia and Ukraine. Uh, I heard today, again on the car on the way here, that Egypt today signed a new deal for a huge loan from Saudi Arabia, uh, basically to, to help it continue to provide bread subsidies uh, because of the, the massive increase in the cost of grain that it's encountered. So Egypt has now been pushed very firmly into the hands of the Saudis, where a country with whom it didn't have particularly great relations uh, before. Um, so that's, that has you know, effects on the people in, in Egypt, but also on the geop geopolitics of Egypt. What we've seen before uh, around the world, when, when food prices go up, you get riots, uh, you get instability, uh, you get hunger, uh, and you get governments that fall. Uh, and so I think we're gonna see an uptick uh, in instability around uh, the world, but particularly in Africa. We already have a famine uh, going on in, in, on the Horn of Africa and Somalia. Uh, which is really, you know, they've had two years of no rain. Uh, 
Um, and so there's a really catastrophic famine starting to get underway there. You throw in the, 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 the lack of uh, grain from, from Russia and Ukraine into that situation, and I think it's really severe, and I think it'll have strong consequences over the next year at least. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. We really appreciate it and um, enjoyed your expertise. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you.